we go through. So thanks very much. And over to Charlotte and Andrew. Okay. Thanks, Amanda. All right. All right. Andrew, do you want to do you want to say anything before we get going? Uh, just I'm really looking forward to sharing some stories and uh, just ought to warn you that Charlotte and I talk a lot. So uh, that's probably my cue <laughs> to actually stop talking and get into the good stuff. So I'm going to throw it straight back at you. It's nice to be with yeah. you. Everyone. Um, if you want a webinar to finish on time, we are not the uh, two presenters you necessarily need for that. Cool. All right. So let me start by telling you what we are going to do today. If Oh, no. Why have I lost control? This was all working fine just now. Do you want me to click on? Yeah, can you? Hey, all right. Brill. Um, I've lost control to Andrew. It's going to be a battle. So we're going to start by looking at storytelling, because storytelling is a very important tool, not only in English language, but in education widely. Um, we're going to be talking about the power of metaphors, and then we're going to be looking at different ways that we can unlock word problems. Um, Andrew is, of course, the mathematics expert. I'm here to represent the story side of things. So so I'm going to get going by giving you a bit of background. Oh, I do have control again now. Brill. So our first question, why do stories matter? And I have found this lovely quote from Albert Einstein. Now, Albert Einstein, not an English teacher. Um, definitely, definitely more on the scientific mathematics side of things. But he said, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. And if you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. So very quickly in the chat box, why, what do you understand from this quote? If you had to put this in your own words, what do you think Albert Einstein means by this? Let's see. Children like stories. Absolutely. I think all children love a story. But just because I like something doesn't mean it's going to make me any smarter, does it? Ooh, Carlay has come up with imagination. Can you tell us a bit more? Why do you think imagination is important? Uh, oh, I love that from uh, my, I should be wearing my glasses, Manjusha. That's a lovely, lovely, lovely thing to say. Children get to know more about the world which they have not encountered. Yes, stories can open doors, can't they? They can show us things that, um, that we've never seen and take us to places we've never been to. Yeah, as Sumi says, they can put us in our situation. They can change our environment. They can change where we are. Um, and as, you know, as, as we have seen and as we know from, from all through histories, stories have always been an important part of how we learn, of how we communicate. Ah, uh, yes, thank you, Andrew. Imagination, more important than knowledge. Lovely quote there. Yeah, yes, fabulous. Um, yeah, and as I'm saying, you know, they, they have always been there from the very earliest, earliest times. The cave paintings on the walls from the very earliest moments depict stories. It's storytelling through pictures, messages that need to be shared, important information that needs to be shared. So let's do it that way. Why? Why do stories matter? Why do stories matter in education? There are so many ways we could look at it. Number one, I think one of the ones that I always come to first is they are motivating. We love to be told a story, as you've already said in the chat box. But not only do we love that, they help us to make sense of new ideas. Hello, Stephanie saying hello in the chat box. Yeah, they help us to make sense of new ideas. We can learn a lesson through a story. We can think of things like, um, you know, traditional tales and Aesop's fables, all of those old historical stories that teach us how we are navigating the world around us. Um, the leopard not changing his spots and all of those wonderful stories that we can use to communicate big ideas from the world around us. 
stories also help our memory. Um, you know, a good story will stay with you much more than than trying to remember historical data in a in a in a sort of black and white way. If you have a story to connect it to. Um, the things I remember from my history lessons, for example, are the things that made me interested. Mm. So the stories behind the people. But they can also help us to shape opinion. Stories inform the way we think about things. And um, yeah, they can also build our communication skills, our subject knowledge and our social skills as well. Stories help us to become better people, to become part of a community. And in a classroom environment, that's a community of learners helping us to work together more effectively. Uh, Oh, lovely, brilliant. So Amina is already sharing in the chat box ways of using stories. Fantastic. Um, and of course, as you will see during this session, they're also a useful tool of problem solving as well. But I think the most important thing we can say about stories is they help us to make connections, connections between ideas. And if we take this in a mathematical context, they help us to understand how maths connects to everything around us. How does mathematics connect to myself? Where is my direct connection to maths? A story can help us understand how maths operates in the world around us. What is the connection there? And it can also help us to connect mathematical ideas and concepts to other mathematical ideas and concepts, making connections between what we've learnt and what we are going to learn, what we have experienced before and what we are learning now. All right. Um, so an example, an example here of how we can use story to help us understand mathematics. As you can see here, we've got a short explanation and a story does not need to be fictional. Stories come in many shapes and sizes. Um, they can be fiction, but they can equally be truth, anecdote, explanation. So here we have an example from, from um, Max Maths. This is level four. It's taken from page 127 and it's all about Venn diagrams and how they work. And this is the story of a Venn diagram. It is the explanation of a Venn diagram. So it's a talking through an experiential story of how we can sort numbers. Five, eight, 10, 25, 31 explaining to the children that the numbers in the uh, left side contains the five times table, the right hand contains odd numbers, and that centre point is the intersection between them, any numbers being taken outside. And it helps to inform that understanding that storification, if that might be, I'm an English teacher, that's now a word. If it wasn't yesterday, it is today. Storification of mathematical problems can help us to understand them better. Right, I'm gonna hand over to Andrew. I'm gonna mute myself for a bit and let him talk to you in a bit more depth. Thanks, Charlotte, that's great. I just wanna actually just go back to here. Um, there's something about stories and drama and acting things out. And there's a principle which um, I call kinesthetic investment and it sounds a bit up itself that phrase but let me explain if i physically do something then it is a step ahead from uh, somebody else doing it because i'm physically invested for example a number line painted on the floor um, and i walk along it and as i walk along it i get a sense of adding a step and if i walk backwards i get the sense of subtracting a step and i've planted myself in that story um, if I make equal like bunny hops along it, that's effectively a model of multiplication. But the concept is there because I can imagine it. That's what that harks back to that Einstein idea. So whenever possible, get children to act these out. Those of you who have those big uh, plastic hoops in your sports hall, for example, you can put two of them on the floor, uh, overlap them and then go, right. OK, so I'd like all the children with blue eyes to stand in this circle and all the children with uh, brown hair or black hair to stand in this circle. And someone will go, oh, but I've got 
boom. And they said, well, I'll tell you what, shall we overlap the circles a bit and then you can stand in the middle. And what that does is it's using story, but not in the once upon a time type of way. I hope that kind of makes sense uh, to that. So um, it's a great way of learning. I want to share a story that um, called How Big Is A Million? Just uh, if anyone's seen this, um, ooh, total physical response. I'm loving that. OK, that's better than my kinesthetic investment. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen this book, but this is uh, one of my absolute favorites. And I, I wanted to start by sharing it with you. Just because my children loved it as a story, not as a math lesson, as a bedtime story. Um, and it's got a superb kicker as well. So just to share this with you, because it's rather joyous. Here it is. How big is a million? And you know what? I don't know how big a million is. It's quite a hard thing to, to envisage. So I'm not going to read every page to you, much as I'd really love to. Um, but it, I'll tell you. So basically, there was a little penguin called Pipkin. And he wanted to know how big a million was. And he didn't know. So he set out on a little uh, journey and he went to ask his mum, but his mum was busy catching breakfast. Beautiful pictures. And she said, is that a million fish? And no, he said, no, no, it's, it's only 10. All right, well, never mind. I'll, that's not a million then. Uh, and anyway, to cut a very beautiful story, fairly short, he, he trudges off and he goes to sea. Uh, he sees some penguins and there they are keeping warm. And there's so much math already going on. And if you count them, there really are a hundred penguins. It's beautiful. And uh, the, it even brings in this idea of, um, you probably know this, if a bunch of penguins huddle together for warmth, they take it in turns to be in the middle, which is kind of gorgeous, really. I think we should learn from that. Anyway, it turns out there's a hundred. And uh, the one in the middle says, no, there's a hundred of us. I don't know how big a million is, but I'll come and help you find out. So uh, it, off he goes and he beats a seal cub. And it starts to snow, and you'll never guess how many snowflakes there are. Not a million, but a thousand. Okay, uh, which is kind of good, really. Um, <laughs> and there actually are a thousand snowflakes on that page, which for, for children is, is amazing. I don't know if you've experienced this. Young children love massive numbers because they excite them. And if a story does nothing but excite us, then it's captured us, as Charlotte was saying. It's kind of a hook. Okay, so a thousand snowflakes there. Anyway, look. He goes on and on and on. He doesn't find a million of things. He goes home. He's very, very tired. He's very sleepy. His mum says, OK, come outside. I've got something to show you. So they look up into the night sky. And in the back of this book, <laughs> I love this, in the back of this book, and I can't even begin to go back far enough to show you, but you'll get a hang of it. It's a poster. And on the poster... There are, oh, oh, I wish I had There are literally a million stars. <laughs> there really are a million stars on this huge poster. And um, all my children have absolutely adored this. It was, it was a story we did uh, as part of Maths Week England last year. Um, for, and it's just absolutely delightful. Now, you might go, well, where's that in the curriculum? And if you're asking that question, then you've really missed the point. Um, then, because maths can be so dry, can't it? It can be such a, a a seemingly detached from our experience thing. Okay, today we're going to do bus stop division, or today we're going to find a percentage of a three-digit number. Why? You know, why? And it's a fair question, why? So I think the ability to see something so incredible hooks us, brings us in, gives us a I want to know. And honestly, that... Uh, that poster has like that wonderful wow moment. Not all books have that kind of wow moment, but I thought I'd start there because that's like just to kind of get a sense of my uh, my passion about these things. But there's a few other books I want to mention to you. Um, the Number Devil. Now this is a novel. This is for older children. Uh, it's about a boy who has a dream, and this boy hates math. So if you have children uh, with the reading age of I'd say an 11 year old upwards, 10 11 year old, uh, who don't like maths. Ask them to read this book because they'll relate to the character. And this character appears to him in a dream and basically says, well, let's start with the number one. What can we do with that? And he goes, well, not much. <laughs> and actually, it turns out everything builds from the number one. And by the end of the story, of course, he's hooked and convinced that math is a stunning and a, a beautiful thing. And he realizes he can do much more than he thought he could before. Um, so that's that one. Um, I have got here A Place for Zero. If you've come across this book. This is beautiful. Uh, I see that uh, Udar's just uh, mentioned place value and uh, bang on cue. Thank you very much. Okay, This book 
is all about um, a sad little number zero. And he's a bit sad because he doesn't feel he's got a place, really. Uh, everyone else, um, they live in a digitaria, okay? And uh, ones were important because, you know, they would, they would be used for counting. Um, seven knew his place. He, he, that was the number of days in a week. Five was the points on the star. Two was handy for counting bicycle wheels. But zero had, you know, nothing going. And look, to cut a long story short, um, zero realises that actually, if he works with somebody else, he can make a whole new set of numbers. And without zero, you can't make hardly any numbers. But suddenly with zero, you can make billions of numbers, which is just so exciting. So he gets his place. So there's a certain amount of um, social... Uh, personal, social, you know, well-being involved in this story as well. Everyone has a place, but the idea that zero can make numbers change their places, um, and uh, all the numbers suddenly think zero is brilliant. And uh, you might you might be interested to know that zero, uh, as a digit, was banned. It was considered quite evil for a long time uh, by kind of the superstitious uh, medieval. Uh, uh, leaders who, who believe that you know you shouldn't have something that represented nothing and so it's you can imagine can't you that's why the romans for example didn't have a zero um, and many counting systems didn't have a zero to start with so i think that's a really interesting story especially as it will help uh, children with more than just the maths okay uh next one grain of rice i love this story i haven't got this one here but um you might be familiar with the uh, old um chessboard problem and uh, there are various versions of this story but effectively if you take a chessboard and you put a grain of rice on the first square and then you double it so on the next square you put two grains of rice and on the next square you put four yes quite right <laughs> what's that? What's that? Uh, four grains of rice and eight grains of rice and and the problem that you set to children is how many grains of rice could you put on the last square and the absolutely fantastic result is that there isn't enough rice on the planet to fill the last square. There's not enough. It doesn't exist. All right? And it's a staggeringly big number. Um, and, and so uh, this, you know, will you give me a grain of rice too? And, and so this person kind of who thought she was only asking for a small thing, they realized she was asking for all the wealth of the country. Uh, so it's a clever, clever story. Um, there's a. There's a fun version of that, which is a kind of bit more basic, um, called Minnie's Diner, where somebody goes in and orders um, a, a soup, a salad, a sandwich, uh, some fries and a hot cherry pie. And the next person comes in and he's twice as big and he has twice as much. And it keeps going on like that and doubling, doubling, doubling. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of more accessible for younger children. But um, that's, a, that's a really nice idea. Uh, in fact, there was... Um, yeah, I, I once made a video years ago of, um, of a, a child trying to con his parents and said, uh, all right, so um, could you give me like um, one pound the first day, two pounds the second day, three pounds the third day, and four pounds the fourth day for a month? And his parents go, yeah, OK. And the other kid kind of sneakily goes and goes, I'm not greedy like my big brother. Can I just have one P the first day and then double it two P the second day, four P the third day? much less and the parents go oh yes i can see you're not so greedy um <laughs> by the end by the end of the month the second child is a millionaire <laughs> okay even just starting from one p and i think just having a lovely story to kick in it takes away the so what of today we're going to double numbers it takes away the so what here's another one the final one for this section is called uh, circumference and at uh, the first round table. Now I'm a dad so any kind of terrible dad jokes and puns I'm absolutely up for. You can more or less guess what's going to happen in this uh, book but there's a chap called Circumference and uh, they're always arguing about the table and no one can sit round it and you know Lady Di of Amateur says we should do this and they try cutting bits off. It's a brilliant brilliant story all about shapes uh, and uh, they, they cut shapes up, put them back together uh, and of course um, they realise uh, oh, an oval table, but then maybe, maybe, anyway, a, a spoiler, <laughs> the round table it is. So they end up with a round uh, table and uh, circumference is honoured 
by being given the name of how far it is around the outside, etc., etc. This is a wonderful book. I mean, a wonderful book. It shows it's got so much geometry, and I think it does the other thing, which I think many many children struggle with. It this this avoids the trap that we fall into of writing down a learning objective with vocabulary in that children haven't met. Like today, we are going to learn about fronted adverbials. Now, what on earth is that? Why are you bothering to tell me that? Because I have no way of processing that information. So I'm anxious about that. Whereas if you give me some examples and they're going to, these are called fronted adverbials, that's so much better way around. So I think that's a great thing to do. Don't tell children that, uh, don't give them a word they don't know uh, in a maths context. Give them uh, a story, give them a reason for doing it. The other day um, I was in Marks and Spencer's uh, or M&S, uh, as we call it here, and I grabbed a sandwich. I couldn't eat it in, so I took it away. So my takeaway was M&S, and none of that's true. But it's what I told my uh, year four class uh, this earlier this week, because they are learning that the thing that you subtract from is called the minuend, and the thing you take away is the subtrahend. I mean, who remembers that, right? Well, I do, because if I, if I do my takeaway or my subtraction from M&S, then I know the order is M and S. And I even changed the class teacher's plans, which he only just noticed yesterday and I was in a bit of trouble. So any kind of story like that can help with vocabulary. Uh, that's enough stories for now. I will come back and share a few more stories with you in a moment. But I'm going to pop it back to Charlotte. Sorry. Uh, there we go. I didn't give you any warning of that at all tonight, Charlotte. <laughs> no, but there we go. I'm, I'm there. there we go. I'm there. Sorry. I'm Sorry. there. Um, yes. So as we have seen, there are lots and lots of things that we can do with our stories. And I think it's worth taking a look at the difference between those strategies. So what can we do with a story? Well, just as we have seen Andrew doing there, we can tell a story. Now, telling a story is not the same as reading a book. Reading a book, the words are on the page. Telling the story is coming from the heart. So Andrew has shown us two different perspectives there. He's shown us reading the words on the page, guiding us through, allowing the children that interaction to ask questions, to see on the page, to look at the million stars. Uh, more <laughs> ideas coming out, absolutely, Leandra. Um, but also we can tell a story and that might be a personal story like Andrew's M&S story. Where's your takeaway from? It's from M&S. Um, we're getting a bit of feedback there. Do we, or is it, it me typing? It might be. Do you want to mute I'll your mute, mic a I'll minute? I'll mute yeah. myself. Yeah, I was just replying to okay. the, uh, replying to the <laughs> yes. um, Yeah, so we can tell a story just like that, from heart. It might be something we've memorized. It might be a personal anecdote that helps to exemplify um, what Andrew was saying there about the, the uh, well, as I think of it, the meta language, the subject language, you know, starting with, um, starting with a story, starting with an example from either personal anecdote or from a book can help us to introduce those big ideas. We can also retell stories, and often the best way to do that is to get the children to retell those stories. Why? Because it involves them much more than just listening to us. So when we've told a story, allowing those children to go off and retell that, um, we can make changes when we retell. We can, uh, when we do, automatically make changes um, when we retell a story. But it also allows us as teachers to check that comprehension, to understand how well they have understand those contexts. Um, and of course, we can act out stories, as Andrew was saying, you know, about the, the Venn diagram at the beginning there. Being able to have that physical movement allows you not just to hear, but to experience what those stories might look like. Um, 
you know, you were you were saying that about the Venn diagram. It reminded me of um, an activity that I was doing in 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 an English language lesson where my my students formed their own pie chart. We were we were trying to establish, you know, what percentage of the class lived in what time zones it was an international group and we we had pie charts around we we formed a circle from a center point and we all stood in our own little sections and it's a great way to visualize what you're saying and of course we can create our own stories and we are going to be asking you to create a little story for us a bit later but as leandra says and as andrew has commented you know that creation can be from the very beginning, from a base point, from our imaginations, but it might also be extending or expanding on a story, taking our original story and finishing it in a different way, or extending it, saying what happens next, and making it personal, making it belong to part of ourselves. So lots and lots of things that we can do with stories. But let's have a look at some practical examples. Monsieur Jeffrey, pop your mic back. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to mic, mic myself back up. All right, this is a, a stunner. When this first came out, I don't know, 10 years ago, it, 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 took, it took me by complete surprise. And, uh, and it took certainly primary education by storm. Um, it's a beautiful story. Before I go, I'm going to show you some of the lovely uh, photographs, uh, pictures of this. Has anyone seen or read this book? Um, because if not, you're going to you're you're going to be salivating at the possibilities. So here's a someone's typing. Let's have a look. Let's see. So this this is a an absolutely unique book. There is oh the video. I didn't know there's a video of it. This is one of those books that is a resource that you can pretty much do whatever you like with. Um, for anyone from year one up to i i can think of stuff i could do with year 10 actually um so yeah okay let me let me show you uh this i won't show you every single page because we don't have time but, but basically uh here we go one is a snail and it gives you a little clue this is a snail's foot that's all it says now you're curious of course you'll love this you will want this okay here we go Right, one is a snail. That's it. That's the first page. It's off to the beach. Okay, I can I can take that. Otherwise, not much to do with that. Hmm. Two is a person. Now, you don't need to say anything to the children because there's some arrows pointing to the person's uh, feet, and there are two feet, which is interesting. So, um, three is actually a snail and a person, and usually by page three. Children are going, oh, I think I know what's happening here. Three is a snail and a person. All right, so we won't move it on just yet. Does anyone want to guess what four is, please? If three is a snail and a person, what do you think four might be? It could be two persons. Yeah. So here we go. I'm doing repeated addition. I'm doing multiplication. It doesn't feel like I'm doing maths, though, does it? I'm, I'm having fun. I'm imagining. What else could it be? What else could it be? It could be two persons, or it could be a person and two snails. Well done, it's actually a dog. There we go. And now I go, oh, now this is very funny because um, here's the thing. Oh, thank you. Is that the link to the, uh, it could be, is that the link to the actual, I'm, I'm so tempted to press that, but I mustn't because I'm supposed to be talking. Okay, so four, four is a dog. And then five, well, it could be a hand, but actually five is a dog and a snail, of course. Okay, and so on and so on. Uh, then we've got six, seven, eight, nine. But look, ten, this is where it goes. From the title, ten is a crab. Oh, that means we can make anything. Now, if you think about it, this is place value. The words place value are never uttered. But eleven is surely a snail and a crab. Or eleven snails. You know. Uh, Twelve might be. A crab and a person, or a crab and two snails. But anyway, let me just move up because I said I'm not going to show you every page in the book. Uh, there's so much joy in it. But 20 is two crabs. 30. Any guesses for 30? No, don't worry. It's three crabs. Or maybe it's 10 people. <laughs> two. 10 lots of two. And a crab. You know, this is fantastic. And then, uh, look, to cut a very long story short, uh, this book goes all the way to 100. 
which could be 10 crabs, of course, but actually here is 100 snails. Now, um, I've shown you maybe a third of the pages in this book, but the utter joy with which children absolutely receive this book, it takes a bit of skill. Now, this is one of those examples where you can't just retell, all right? You have to show, you have to demonstrate. This isn't something like circumference, which I could read, or a place for zero, which I could just read. This is all about the images. And I, I would like to suggest that a child who goes through this book with the teacher a couple of times, not only loves it and laughs at it, but also has an innate understanding of place value that they may not be able to express, but they will start to own. And ownership is a huge thing that's so often missing from people's mathematics experiences, isn't it? I mean, for example, how many of you felt at school that math was something they did to you as opposed to art? or story writing. I'd be interested. Who felt that? Just, just yes or no, really. Did you, did you feel, obviously art is yours, you create something. Story writing, creative writing is yours, you create something. Um, but maths, yes or no? Did you feel that you were creating something or were you doing somebody else's problems? So a quick straw yes or no poll. There's a yes, okay. It is. It is. I want some yeses and noes. Just yes, I owned maths, or no, maths was something that was basically done to me. There we go. There's a no. Yeah. Okay. Just gonna wait for a few. I know there's 140 odd people here, so I'm gonna just push you. Yeah, okay. No. So I've. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've barely seen a no. Oh, there's a yes. That's good. Okay. That's good. You you still own it. Okay. That's good. No. Yeah. So I, I think, I mean, those of you who haven't typed in, I imagine I'm going to assume that you're fairly, this is a very typical representative sample. <sighs> and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to talk to you about someone else now who felt very disenfranchised um, by maths. There's a yes. Hooray. Good. I'm glad for you. Uh, that's great. Uh, I, yeah, I kind of did in the end think that maths was, was me, but that's maybe for another time. So I want to introduce you now to uh, Joe. All right. And uh, Joe um, was an ant, a soldier ant. OK, well, that's good. That's good. So it's a shame, isn't it, that it takes us a long time to realise what maths is. I think at school, many of us don't realise what maths is. We think it's just rules to be followed and uh, answers to be calculated. What will be 101? Oh, I don't know. 101 snails, uh, 50 people and a snail. Uh, 25 dogs and a snail. I don't know. <laughs> There's so many. It would be a nice investigation. What about eight crabs, 10 snails? And, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting distracted by your question. Okay, which I guess makes my point. Here we go. So this is Joe. Now, um, again, it's not a book I'm going to give you every page of, but um, Joe was a soldier ant, and he was very proud to be marching along with the other 24 soldier ants in his troop. I suspect there are around there, but I haven't actually counted them. Now, oops, what happens is... Um, um, they, they get into uh, twos, they get into twos and they march along. But of course, there's 24 of them and that's uh, 12 twos. And he's left out at the back. He doesn't have a partner and he's a bit sad. So what happens with Joe? And again, this is another one where you, the pictures are absolutely paramount. That's why these ones are in the presentation for you. Um, Joe's a bit sad. So they go, well, OK, let's um, they're marching past the Queen on parade. Uh, let's go for threes. So that seems better. But look, they get into threes and there's eight rows of three there and he's still left out which is kind of quite sad really so um he's getting a little bit sad oh there's the two I managed to get that one in the wrong order there we go uh then so there's the he gets in twos he's left out okay we've got 12 rows of two uh then the threes all right and then so what do you think they try now and you ask the children what do you think they try? and they'll go oh try fours try going around in fours so they they all line up in fours and he's really excited because finally he gets to hang out with people except he doesn't because look there's six the other 24 hours going six rows of four. So he's getting really, really depressed. And then, of course, right near the end of the book, they have this brilliant idea. And the brilliant idea is what? And I now, at this point, I might stop the book. I might ask children what they think is going to happen, just like uh, someone said earlier, what do you think might happen next? And it's very predictable, isn't it? That you've, you've lined up in twos, you've lined up in threes, you've lined up in fours, what are you going to do? 
line up in fives. So they line up in fives. And of course, you have worked this out. If there's 24 of them and one of him, that's 25. And he's super happy. He's fantastic. He's in. And, you know, there's lots of celebration and joy. Now, um, I don't need to tell you that this is about uh, factors and division and multiples and remainders. There's something else in this book. Hi, uh, welcome those of you joining us. There's something else in this book which is not mentioned, but this page, the ants are now in a square. They're now in a square. And you can't do that with any old number of ants, can you? You can do it with 25 ants. You could do it with 16 ants. Could you do it with nine ants? I might say to children, investigate how many different, how many ants could you do it with? And there are some numbers that you can make squares from. We need to come up with a name for these these square numbers, children, don't we? I wonder what wonder what word we could come up with. Well, I, I can't think. Maybe we could call them ant numbers or something. And so what you've got is that idea, that CPL idea, concept precedes language. We all know about CPA, concrete, pictorial, abstract, but CPL, the concrete preceding the language. Now, this technically is pictorial, but if you give children uh, blocks or cubes or counters and, get, and ask them to make them into squares, then I've got six-year-old children understanding what a square number is in a deeper way than maybe a 10-year-old might, because they just think it's X times it's a self, whatever. So I think that's beautiful. And this idea of remainders and division, really versatile, but absolutely you need the, um, you need the pictures for this, right? You, you definitely need the images for this. But again, I don't think the story is the lesson. I think the story is the... I don't know, the teaser, the trailer, the springboard, if you will, for such rich understanding of, uh, of math lessons. So, right, having said that, um, I'm going to move on to this. Okay. And uh, so, Charlotte, uh, you were going to talk about this. Yes, one. I was. But I, I actually quickly just want to um, skip back to that previous slide there. Um, mm. Yeah. OK, so so I'm not a maths teacher. Um, I, I think I was lost in maths somewhere around primary school and me and maths never caught up with each other ever again. Um, which is really sad. It, it saddens me in so, so many ways. Um, I wish I had you as my teacher, Andrew. Because, because right now, I feel like at the tender age of 41, I now have a much better understanding of what a square number is Ooh. than I have ever had in my life. Um, and that's all thanks <laughs> to you. Wow, like my my mind is completely blown. You know, <laughs> no matter you know, like I was I was told, and and this may actually be wrong because this is me testing my memory that a square number is a number that is only divisible by itself and one. No, that's prime numbers. See, prime like numbers. you right. know, my my um my brain, <laughs> my brain and maths, we are not friends. But wow wow like just the power of visualization and the power of story there to make you know someone someone like me someone who considers themselves to have an allergy to mathematics <laughs> and numbers um yeah, I always say to my students, you know, I'm not great at maths and I have very much this fixed mindset about that as well. You know, um, like I don't feel I have the, the ability to change, but, um, you know, just seeing this right now, it, it's mind blowing. It's absolutely mind blowing to me. Um, and I can only imagine how it must feel if you are a primary age child and you are learning in in such a powerful way um and you know it it, it is it is really yeah as as the people are saying in the chat box you know making it practical is the easy way to go the vi this visual is also perfect for triangular numbers leandra are triangular and andrew are triangular numbers a thing I have oh, they are. Voice. They right. have to be. See, my maths again, it's not great. <laughs> but wow. Mm. Yeah, just having that ability to, to look at that. But of course, stories don't need 
to be long complicated tomes as we've said you know we've got we've got books like these that are absolutely wonderful for supporting learning and helping children to understand messages and ideas but even things like a little word problem in our book can be presented as a story now you know we for those of you that are working with max maths you will know how wonderful the the images and the visuals are in it it is very much that that cpa approach of the concrete the pictorial the abstract working through that process enabling that that visualization of mathematics and and you know, we all know that's proven to work as a strategy. But what we can see here is that stories can even come in the simplest form. This is a story. Jade has 89 stamps. She gives her friend 34 stamps. It's a story to use a story that communicates an idea, a story that can help us to create those images in our minds. And we ask how many stamps has she left? Well, when we look at this, we're actually looking at an equation, a simple equation of 89 minus 31. But if you take a learner like myself, who maybe has you know prior experience of mathematics or self-doubt about mathematical ability and 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 i do speak from personal experience to say that 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 fear and that self-doubt can come in very very early in the learning process as i said i i became lost in primary and i never caught up again mathematically um you know the only thing i can do now is percentages and that's because i'm a teacher <laughs> that's what i call teacher maths um yeah you know, so being able you know when i when i see a, a visual equation such as this 89 minus 34 i start to panic i, I have a physical reaction to that but if I have a story behind it, Jade has 89 stamps, she gives her friend 34 stamps, what I can start to do is, is visualize in my imagination. I can start to make those. And of course, with Max Maths, we then can explore and we can map that out. We can retell that story in a physical way using number blocks. We can retell that story using our own pictorials and our own diagrams that we are creating. Or if you're really ambitious, you can draw a beautiful picture of 89 stamps in nice rows and create it that way and take your one million stars onto the screen. Uh, <laughs> so what we'd like you to do, or what Andrew's going to ask you to do, <laughs> we're going to give you a little equation. And in the chat, well, I, I, mean, I might as well just do it. I've, I've said half of it already. Um, we're going to give you a little equation. So on the screen, an equation is about to pop up in the chat box. Can you write us a little story? <laughs> Qatar 2022 album stamps. <laughs> is it football time nearly? I do not live in a football world. Right, there's an equation on the screen. Make me a simple story. How could you storify this equation? Let's see what examples we come up with. What do you think, Angie? You got any ideas? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> it's not just maths, it's MS maths. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, it is. Mm. Minuend, subtrahend. Mm. That's two you new should... words I don't know. <laughs> no, I wouldn't worry too much. Um, yeah, that, what can I say? This, um, so I, I, this could be about um, miles. I mean, the thing is, what, what I don't think we ever really say to children is, is that numbers are adjectives and nouns. It's a very difficult concept, that. You think about it. 12, yeah. 12 what? I mean, it, if we see it on its own, we assume it's 12 ones. But actually, it's not always 12 ones, is it? It might be, you know, anything. Um, 12 jelly beans. Yeah. Hey, there we go. Marble oh, a story. from Adonica. <laughs> you see, the thing is, we all overthink that. Everyone's going, what could it be? What could it be? And <laughs> you just go on, all right, if it's marbles, then da -da 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 -da. bang. Yeah. 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 Oh, there know. we go. <laughs> two more, <laughs> two were eaten, seven were eaten by a monkey. 
Yeah, you do. You do get some fantastic because kids' imagination is so much better than ours, right? You know that absolutely. Uh, uh, that, that's one of the facts of uh, just getting older is that you you dare less because you, you know that some things are either unacceptable or absurd. Whereas children don't care about that, so they will go to the absurd. Hopefully, not the unacceptable. You know, but it could be minutes. It could be um, glasses of wine. Um, you know, yeah. I had twelve. I had twelve glasses of wine. Uh, uh, and then the you had seven more. That's probably not the greatest idea, Andrew. Then I had seven more. Yeah, but now, now I'm looking at the next. I go. So then I went to the bathroom. Um, you know, and I, dot dot dot. Now that's not a, you know, but <laughs> just it could be it could be cups of orange juice. It doesn't have to Absolutely. be. Absolutely. Like, you know, and maybe going to the bathroom isn't the best example. But you know what I mean. Um, I could have eaten too many burgers and I was sick. Yeah, or I put nineteen on my plate, but then someone looked at me hungry, so I gave them three. They could only eat one of them. Took two back. You know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, I had it's 12 perfect. essays to mark, then my students uh, gave me another seven. So I gave ooh. three of them to my friend, but she couldn't read them. So she gave me two of them back. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. How many essays did I mark? Yeah. And of course, then what we can do, we can get our, we can get the children in our class to share these stories with each other, get them involved, you know, Every child writes their own story and shares it with a friend to work out those equations, to work out those answers. Right, we're, we're getting distracted. Andrew, I'm going to put my mic off and let you um, continue on. I'll uh, see you in a bit. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try something now that well, I haven't actually practiced. Never, ever do that, obviously. So I'm going to go to this and see if it, I clicked on whiteboard. Has the screen gone blank? Has everybody's screen gone blank and white? Okay, yeah, so, yes, yeah, you're good, you're good. That's good. Now, does that mean I can write? Uh, I don't know. Does that mean I can write? Let's find out. Let me try and draw. Uh, now I need to find out how to draw on this, of course. Uh, um, hmm, maybe we should have kind of checked that really before I went. Uh, whiteboard. Mm, can't actually draw on the whiteboard. That's interesting. Anyone know how to draw? Mate, that's my fault for not practicing. Don't worry about that. I will go back to the presentation. But what I was going to do, and maybe you can all do this on a piece of paper, is um, a dot. Just put a dot near the middle top of a piece of paper for me. Okay. okay. And we're going to call that um, an apple. Okay. You can even draw an apple if you're feeling good. And then underneath the apple, not directly underneath it, but like, you know, just one to the left and one to the right, draw a couple of um, other fruits. I want you to do a pear on the left and a pear on the right a nice prickly pear okay. and i love that one i love the example of a pear because it's a pear right and i've got two of them and you've got all sorts of fun there i wonder if anybody can tell me this is a bonus can anybody tell me a very well-known story which has an apple and a pair of pears in it uh, a bonus point for anybody who can tell me i better check the time before i i know oh, we've got time we've, we're okay Sean. Are we? we're, we're okay we're on schedule just checking with my partner okay well Anyone know? Someone's typing. I'm just going to see if they got it. And it's part of my magic show, actually. I love doing this for the younger children. Um, so I'm very fond of this story because it doesn't appear to be a mathematical story at all. No. Can you repeat the question? Um, no, because I'm out of time. Sorry. <laughs> the, 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 right, I will. the question was, in which famous story do you find an apple and a couple of pears? Oh, there we go. Someone's got it. Well done. Yeah, there it is. Chris Lee it's this, right? The very hungry caterpillar whose name is uh, Eric. We don't actually find out that his name is Eric, but I've decided to call him that. So um, look, in the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. We know this, okay? Um, one Sunday morning, the warm sun came out and pop out of the egg came a tiny and very hungry caterpillar. Um, and I love this story because you never know what's gonna happen in the story. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. Um, he started to look for some food. Let me turn the page over. Okay. Uh, and on Monday, he ate through one apple. Uh, but, oh, here he is again. He ate through one apple, but he was still hungry. Now, I love this because you can actually, look, talk about kinesthetic investment. There we go. One apple, all right? And then a pair of pears, and then uh, three plums, four strawberries, five oranges. Okay. If you don't know this story, uh, get in the sea, honestly. But this is a great story. You didn't get the name of it. It's called The Very... Hungry caterpillar. He actually turns into a butterfly at the end. Spoiler. It's a magic story. Okay. Um, but but here's the point. Um, he ate uh, one 
a uh, piece of fruit on Monday and then two on Tuesday. Now you've you've made a little triangle, haven't you? Yeah, with your how many how many pieces of fruit are there in that triangle? Three, Charlotte's gonna be three, okay. Three. All right. Now underneath that, if you were to draw three plums, again, the central plum directly beneath the apple and the other two either side, you've still got a triangle. And uh yeah, sh yeah, uh, a six. All right, there's six. Yeah. So six is called a triangle number, and so is three. Okay, now, and after that, it was four strawberries. So if you draw four strawberries, or frankly dots, who cares, underneath, you've got 10, and 10 is a triangle number, and now you'll never forget it. Five oranges, boom, exactly. Now, how boring would it be if I, well, it'd be quite easy if I drew dots on the, on the board, but just by sharing a story, and because it's in a magic show, he does actually obviously turn into a butterfly magically, all that sort of stuff. But, but now we know what triangular numbers are. And I have, I, he moves along a fruity line of numbers, counting as he goes to realise that there's 15 bits of fruit that day. Um, it's just a very powerful example of all sorts of things. You tell a story, you see a story, you act out a story. It kind of puts all of those things that Charlotte mentioned earlier together. So yes, you're reading it, you're retelling it a bit, you're acting it out. You know, so you don't think that you're you're one or the other. And there's that. I only, I only thought that because somebody asked about triangular numbers. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, right. So uh, where am I? OK. Um, oh, yeah. A couple more. Now, this is we're back to you. We've got. Um, yeah, we've got about seven or eight minutes left. So here's a couple of things. Um, this is from Max Maths 2. It's a very clear image. All right. It's about dividing blocks. But don't feel that because it's about dividing blocks, it has to be about dividing blocks when you bring it to life. So you have now got 30 seconds to think how you might bring this to life using the principles we've talked about today in the chat. Go. That's a big challenge. Ooh, I wonder what they're going to come up with. I don't know. I mean, like my mind is, my mind is completely, uh, completely blown. I think I might bring a little drama in, and drama is a type of story. I think um, it is. Yeah, for sure. You know, when we watch a play, when we make a film, we could dramatize this a little, no doubt. Maybe how many have we got? We've got two blocks of tw 12 is a student number that I might have in my class. So I might try and get my students to act this one. Always. Uh, yeah. Rearranging themselves. Um, maybe we could even reenact the, uh, the, the ant story that you were showing us earlier. Yeah. Yep. Or create our own version. Create our mm -hmm. own version. Yeah. So blocking and things. That's good. See okay. what our see what our participants are coming up with. Sports Ooh, Huda, yeah. yeah. tell us more. Yeah. Sports That's day teams. Good. Yeah. Chocolate bar. Absolutely. Twelve chocolate mum shares weekly. Yeah. You see, who doesn't love chocolate? Perfect. I mean, there must be some weirdo who doesn't chocolate. like chocolate. But you know, I, you're dead to me. Honestly, I don't know who doesn't like chocolate. Uh, People who don't want to like chocolate, that's different. Okay, student has a crate of mangoes. That's special. And he intends to share the mangoes in food present. Yeah, exactly. Culturally appropriate. Yeah, use, I mean, use whatever your uh, your culture is. Um, you know, if, Ooh, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm coming to Oman, I'm probably not going to go big on wine. Look at this. Yeah, distribute fruit. Fruit's always a safe one. I think what Charlotte said is great. Children, okay? Use the children. Okay. Now, one of the great things about Max Math is, although we're asking you to do a bit of work, yeah, simple. Yeah, context. That 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 gives a why. Um, one of the great things about mathematics is um, the final example I've chosen for you. Uh, sometimes does it for you. Have a just have a look at this. Mm. You'll see. You'll see why we chose this. Uh, well, a couple of reasons why we chose this. Um, the story's written for you. I don't know who Tia and Toby are. Well, I do actually. They're just they're the characters, characters from the book. book. You know yeah. that. Even I. But it know doesn't that. matter. It doesn't matter who they are. <laughs> Right, um, they're far too young to go to COS, but there you go. Now they've missed the boat. That's exciting. You've missed the boat. How do you know? Because of the time, you've got the language of before, you've got the language of after. I mean, this is this is a great one to finish on because actually, stories are there. They're there. They, you know, I mean, it's no, it's no coincidence that I don't get photos of what my friends had for dinner on social media. I, I get notified that they've updated their story. 
because your life is your story. And so whether it's true or it's not true, it's relatable. And everyone loves a story. And look at this, it gives you the story. So this is a, a key stage two, a year four example, I should say. Um, you could almost certainly, whatever you were doing, couch it in somebody's story. So I hope that's uh, useful. Right, I'm out of useful things to say. Charlotte, back to you. Well, I think I think what we need to say at this point is over to the chat box. Are there any questions? I think we have a few um, minutes left. And certainly I'm going to pop the um, contact information up on the screen. And maybe Amanda would like to join us again, just in case there's any important messages at the end of the week. Um, but yeah, if you do have any questions, give us a give us a heads up in the chat box. We've got a few minutes left and we'll try and answer them for you. It's not and like I, I, I finished early, is it? Can I just can I just say, Andrew, how grateful I am? Um, I might Andrew and I actually live quite nearby each other. I might be knocking on your door for some maths lessons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I'll read your story, though. Come on, I'll read your story. Excellent. Brilliant. This is great. Have you seen this? 365 penguins. He gets a new one every year, every day of the year. <laughs> this is this has got a good eco safer planet message as well. Brilliant. So, All right. Amanda, go. was there anything you needed to let anyone know while we've got a couple of minutes here? Just thanks very much. I can answer that question. Definitely. You will get the PowerPoints. You will get a certificate for today's session and a certificate if you've managed to be with us for all four sessions. And there will be links to watch all the webinars again and, and share with other colleagues. Thanks very much, Charlotte and Andrew. Great. I love the squares as well. I thought that was so, yeah, I, I, that really helped me, actually. All the stories were, were, were great. Really good. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Um, thanks again, Charlotte and Andrew. Great session. Uh, we will be running more sessions in January when we will start. So we've had sort of fairly broad themes for this week. Uh, in January, we're going to take the sessions. Um, I would say we're going to take them a little bit more narrow and focus on some of the areas that I know people sometimes struggle with within maths. So we'll be sending out details of those. Um, I'm going to say the Christmas word before we break for the Christmas holidays. So um, <gasps> is that the first time you've said it, it in 2022? Yes, yeah. Um, I tell you what, when we send out the email, we'll put in some of these books as well. Um, and I'm sure they're probably all available on Amazon or at your local bookstores. Oh, no doubt. Thank no you doubt. very much indeed for joining us. Um, it's been a privilege to be part of this. Uh, fantastic speakers we've had this week and, and so great to see so many of you from all over the world. And thanks again to Amanda for, for being behind the yeah, scenes, yeah, making sure that. that everything's working, oh, yeah, um, keeping that. keeping us Good two stuff. in check. And, uh... <laughs> no mean thing. Well done, Charlotte. Yeah. <laughs> thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your days wherever you are. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.